So this is an Ask Me Anything session, guys. And my name is Brenna Left, which some of you guys may know me from uh, doing events at Midwestern. Um, and I'll turn my camera on here again in a second. But first, I just want to introduce myself. I am an academic and industry relations manager with Aspen Dental Management, Inc., also known as ADMI. I have been with Aspen about two years now, and I am joined by a very wonderful panelist, Dr. Mather. I'm going to have him introduce himself here in a moment. Um, we're also hoping Dr. Michael Cooper can join us tonight. I'm sure many of you guys know him as a graduate from Midwestern. Um, unfortunately, he's working a little bit late, so we were hoping, or we are hoping, that he will just jump in in the middle of this, but um, obviously the patient comes first, so we will see if he joins us or not, but fingers crossed. Um, but also, I just want to let you guys know that we do have a live Q&A, so if you guys want to submit questions into that, I think a couple of people already have, um, it should be at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit questions anonymously there if you would like. I also have all of the questions that you guys have submitted in advance. Thank you so much. We had some great questions submitted there, so we're going to um, try and get through all of those as well, and I do those have those on a second screen, so once I turn my camera back on, you'll see me kind of going back and forth. And I promise I'm paying attention. There's nothing more exciting going on to my right. Um, just making sure we get through everybody's questions. And also, I wanted to show you guys some important links. So um, we do have a very fun event coming up for our fourth years. If you guys are interested, it is our vibe session. Obviously, it's virtual with everything going on these days, but it's this weekend. And if you would like to register and you are a fourth year and you don't have any plans this weekend, um, you can go ahead and take a picture of that link and register after this is done. Uh, we are also offering free CE throughout the rest of the year. So take advantage of that, guys. It's pretty awesome. Um, it's just kind of our way of giving back during COVID and hopefully providing for some um, ways for you guys to continue your education. Um, all right, those are the slides that I have for you. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And we will have Dr. Mather introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Samir Mather. I am from Arizona. Uh, I went to dental school in Oregon back and I graduated in 2010. Uh, I basically started with Aspen Dental out of dental school and I've now currently owned four offices in the West Valley. So kind of near where Midwestern is in the Glendale area. And I'm hoping to purchase two more in the year of 2021 to get me to a tally of six offices. Um, awesome. Sorry about that. I was getting my uh, screen set up here. Um, no thank problem. you for that introduction. Um, and like I said before, we're hoping Dr. Michael Cooper will join us tonight. So we will see if he pops in or not. Um, but again, this is an Ask Me Anything session, guys. So please feel free to ask us anything. Easy questions, hard questions. That is what we are here for. And we'll try our best to get to all of them. So again, throw anything in the live Q&A. And um, I think I'll go ahead and get us started with some of the questions that you guys have submitted in advance. So Dr. Mather, the first question I have for you is a nice broad one. Uh, why did you choose Aspen Dental? So I know you talked a little bit about your background in, in your intro, but if you want to, I guess, elaborate more and talk sure. about why you chose Aspen. Sure. Um, so a little background on it is, you know, I remember when I went to dental school, I thought there was like a set protocol of how a dentist works their life. So I thought, okay, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go work somewhere, perhaps for two years, hone my skills, develop my clinical speed, develop my clinical confidence, and then go start a uh, private practice at any, you know, any location. Um, the reason why I actually joined Aspen Dental was I had an upper classmate who had uh, started with Aspen Dental and said that they gained a lot of knowledge. Uh, they were able to do a lot of dentistry. And I was like, oh man, I was also, I should also mention, I was also contemplating possibly doing a residency. Uh, but when that upper classman said, man, you could come learn a lot with Aspen Dental and truthfully, you get paid a little more than you do in residency. I was like, hey, okay, that sounds, that sounds good to me. And another vote of confidence was my roommate in dental school also joined Aspen Dental. And he was like, you got to come join. <laughs> And he's currently an owner of eight practices in Arizona. So uh, we, you know, just hearing from people who I, you know, I, I, that vouch for Aspen and all, I just said, hey, let me give it a try. And so 
I started with Aspen Dental and I haven't looked back. It's been the best decision I've ever made. Mm -hmm. um, was Dr. Song your roommate? He was my roommate. Oh man, we're called Harold and Kumar. It was uh, that, it was good times for sure. That is funny. I did not know that. It was a yeah, time. it's all right. It's a good time. <laughs> you two just taking over Arizona together. That's what we're trying. Um. All right. So you uh, mentioned the topic we both did of DSOs. So before we get started, um, we're definitely going to throw that term around quite a bit. So for those of, I guess, everyone who doesn't know, can you elaborate on what a DSO is? Sure. Sure. So a DSO stands for a dental service organization. So what a DSO does, and, and this is, again, my opinion, is they take care of the management side of the dental office. So they provide, they actually provide all my patients. They provide, they do all my accounting. They do all my marketing. They do all the advertising. They do all the, um, I just do the dentistry. Uh, Full, full transparency. I, I do what I went to dental school for, which, you know, is to use these two guys right here and work in people's mouths. And they take care of everything else to make sure my practices are flourishing. Um, the one thing that I do want to distinguish Aspen Dental from a lot of the other DSOs is we are a dentist support organization. So they, I can, I can attest for this. They allow me to have full autonomy and they just give me such great support in any facet of, of the practices, of any of my practices, which you know, I just, I never think could have been possible. And I should also mention, I know you were kind of asking why Aspen Dental. The reason why I also stuck with Aspen Dental is I thought, you know, I'd get out of dental school, go start a private practice. I would never think I would be a multi-practice owner. That was not something that even was fathomable, fathomable to me, you know, until I joined Aspen Dental. So they really, really opened up my eyes and broadened the horizon for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what's really cool is you brought up the fact that it, it is a support organization that allows you to just focus on the dentistry. Um, and what's awesome about that is you can also be as involved on the business side as you want to be. I think Absolutely. a lot of people have kind of the fear that like the business side is going to like take over. But I mean, Dr. Mather is 100% the owner of his practice. So he Correct. has final say and is as involved as he wants to be with all of the business aspects of the practice. Correct. Absolutely. Um, we did have a follow-up question, um, which was, I'm trying to find one that kind of pertains here. Um, so somebody wanted to know um, the biggest difference between Aspen Dental and other DSOs. So I can only go by hearsay. You know, what mm -hmm. I can talk about is I have some docs who have worked at other DSOs or friends who worked at other DSOs. Uh, one thing I could say is we are really patient centric. Um, and, you know, the patient comes first and foremost. We are not a number organization. So what I mean by that, we, we have targets or goals that we would like to achieve, but there's no set. There's a lot of places where they have these things called quotas. We have no set quota. I don't have to do 50 crowns in a month um, to make some type of number. You have total autonomy, which I absolutely love. I've never in the 10 years uh, that I've been with Aspen Dental has anyone said, hey, Dr. Mather, why, are you, uh, why, aren't, why aren't we doing a root canal on this tooth that's borderline restorable or anything like that? No, I just don't feel the prognosis is good. I'm going to take this tooth out and maybe recommend a implant. If it's a bridge spot, it's great. If it's partial, whatever it is. But it's never, I have total clinical autonomy. Uh, the other thing that I really like about Aspen is I, I truthfully really like how they compensate dentists. And what I mean by that, and I'm sure we might discuss this in some mm -hmm. further questions because it's usually one of the more popular questions, mm -hmm. but what I really like about it, it's not cannibalistic. And what I mean by cannibalistic, I do know that there are other DSOs out there where you have to meet certain numbers or you get credit for the production that you produce. So the stories that I hear from other dentists, and granted, I this is just from, this is hearsay, but what I hear from other dentists is they're trying to go see the crown and they might find some flaw in the crown or there might not even be a flaw in the crown and they have to do a reprep. But the reason they reprep is so they'll start getting credit for the production of that crown. There's nothing like that at Aspen Dental. What ends up happening is every, all the production from all the providers gets pulled into that one particular practice and everybody shares in that profit. So there's nobody like, oh, okay, Dr. Mather is doing all the big surgery cases or if Dr. Cooper gets on, oh, he's placing all the implants or he's stuck doing all the fillings and working with uh, maybe some lower uh, productive um, procedures. 
there's nothing like that. It all goes into one pot. We just want to get the patients taken care of. And at the end of the day, it becomes fruitful for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you brought up some, some pretty awesome topics that actually pertain to a lot of the questions that we had submitted in advance. Um, the quotas is a big one. I get that question all the time when I do lunch and learn. So I'm really glad you brought that up no quotas. I, I love that question because I love kind of squashing it and, and letting Absolutely. people know we don't have any quotas. Uh, clinical autonomy was another great topic that you brought up and compensation. And we had some questions about that. So I just want to let everyone know we will definitely get into that a little bit more. Um, but we did have another follow-up question um, in our live Q&A here that is, what is the difference between owning a corporate office versus owning a private practice? So this is a good question because I've never owned a private practice. So I'm just kind of going based off what I believe, you know, owning a, you know, what I would, you know, a corporate office, I feel like I get a lot of support in aspects where I don't have to deal with hundred percent of the things. Um, I think owning my pr a private practice outright, I would have to take care of a lot of hands-on things um, where I just don't know how people find the time uh, to do certain things, but obviously that was the way that dentistry happens. I've only known Aspen Dental to be quite forthcoming. And yeah, I, I couldn't even see myself ever selling out and going into private practice. They're like, oh man, I don't want to deal with a lot of the stuff that maybe private owners have to deal with. That marketing, that advertising, getting those new patients in the door. Like I have friends in private practice, when they see 12 to 13 new patients a month, that's a great month for them. For me, I'm seeing 100 to 120 new patients a month. And for me, that's, and it's strong and it's easily done. It's something that you know, in dental school, you're just like, oh my gosh, you're going to see that many patients. It's, it's very systematic. It makes sense. And yeah, it's the dentistry I enjoy doing. So mm -hmm. that's, I don't know. I know that's not the best answer in the world because I wish I did private practice, <laughs> but I can say I have a doc that I shadowed for a long time. He owned his own private practice and he's coming to join me at Aspen Dental, <laughs> sold his practice, Waited for his two-year non-compete just so he could join Aspen Dental. He had a practice out in Scottsdale. So I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward for a Scottsdale opening so I could get him on board. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I, that's actually a really fun fact. I didn't know that as well. Um, but we are opening a practice in Scottsdale. So that's super fun. Yeah, it's exciting. That. Oh, man, but closer commute, hopefully. Um, and we're going to jump ahead, I guess, than the, the structure I had, because we're getting a lot of questions about ownership. And I think because you're obviously one of our, our multi-practice owners. Um, so we will jump ahead to that section of this. So a question I have for you, and this one's a little bit long, so I might have to repeat it. Um, sure. Could you elaborate on your experience as a multi-practice owner within this corporation, specifically how it works, where you're buying practice, uh, practices, but also are you working with Aspen clinically, um, mostly just owning the practices? Um, yeah, you have associates question. under you. I guess you just want to elaborate on all of that. Sure, I'll try to do my best. Um, no, <laughs> totally great question. So I, maybe I'll just kind of start from the beginning and kind of work my way through how the mm -hmm. structure works for owning all the practices. So obviously okay. I started with one single practice up in North Phoenix. Uh, you know, I got into the practice. I was the sole dentist at that office. We, initially, we eventually got the office where the demand could support having an associate in that office as well. So once I got to that point, uh, there were other offices that were available that for purchase through Aspen Dental. And I initially had my reservations, nothing about the company. It was just more like, oh man, everything is going really well here. If I go to this other one, am I gonna be spreading myself thin? Am I gonna share, you know, have that same success? And uh, it, took, it took a little while to me get convinced mentally and I ended up purchasing an office out in Goodyear. And I then had the two offices. And what I would do is I, I had a doc who, the doc who was with me, who was my associate, I transplanted into him to the Goodyear office. And he was my, what we call MCD, managing clinical uh, dentist at that particular mm -hmm. office. So he was with me for about a year and a half. So he kind of saw how the model works. And he basically took that and emulated that and emulated that in the Goodyear office. And that office started to, you know, slowly start to ramp up and it started getting demand. Um, and I would probably visit that office initially at the beginning, I was probably going once a week and I'd have a part-time doctor that would come in and work on the day that I wasn't there. And uh, eventually I started realizing, okay, two offices, you know, was good. And I was like, I started getting into a rhythm. And I then purchased a third office, the surprise office. 
And once I got to the third one, I kind of had to strategically uh, manage my time. And what I mean by that, I was prim primarily at my main office, probably four days a week. And I would go to the other office that I just purchased, the third one, and surprise, uh, once a week. Um, initially, I was there a little bit more, uh, but I got that doctor kind of ramped up. I got a little lucky, to be full transparent. <laughs> I got lucky because I got an internal transfer from Aspen who understood the model. So I didn't have to spend a lot of time that they're already with the company, ooh, I would say a year and a half. And so that office kind of took off as well. So I kind of was put in some fortuitous situations in that regard. But what I will say, I was offered more offices and initially I was just gun shy, uh, just because like, oh man, I don't know if I can do it. Is this something, like I was saying, I didn't even think being a multi-practice owner um, was something even in, in, in the cards for me. But if I, if I, if older me could tell younger me, I'd be like, I should have bought all of them when I could at that time, because it's the best decision I can make because you get so much support from the ADMI team. Uh, they provide so much guidance. They're not going to let anything falter or any, any practice, um, you know, go under, so to speak. They are going to make sure you're prospering and they'll provide everything that they can and every resource that they can to make sure that it's successful. Uh, but most of the time, you know, I, have an associate and I try to, you know, develop them, coach them and mentor them as much as I possibly can. And then we get, and when they feel ready and confident, it was the same thing with me. I was an associate initially and I kind of worked up with one of the owner doctors out in the Mesa office. And I was like, man, about, I would say about a year out, I was like, man, I can do this. I, I think I could crush it. And this is the type of dentistry I enjoy doing. And I was like, I'm ready to spread my wings. And and I did. And that's what I want to do with all the docs that come work with me as well. Mm -hmm. So is there a specific timeline for how long it takes to become an owner? No, uh, I wouldn't say there's any type of timeline. It, it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. I've seen people who become owners in six, seven months. Um, I got, I was an associate and went straight to ownership. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't become an MCD initially. And, and I know some docs who have become associates, MCDs, and then owners. But it's been various timelines. I've heard some that have done it like under a year. I've heard some that have been an MCD at an office for two, three years and then decide to own. Um, if the office is doing well and you're under the Aspen management, um, under ADMI and it's doing well, I would say own as soon as you possibly can uh, mm -hmm. because it's, again, it's very fortuitous, but there is no set timeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's very important to say is that there there is no set timeline in there's no, I mean, cap as well to how many offices that, that one doctor can own. I think the average doctor probably owns like two or, two or three offices. I think you, you said you own like eight, seven. I, I currently own four. I'm trying to buy two in 2021. Ah, picking those up. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So there, there's really no set, um, amount. There's no set timeline on average. It probably takes about two, two and a half years. Um, to become an owner, but we recently had a couple doctors, new grads do it in less than a year. Um, yep. So if that's what you want to do. And you come with the attitude that's like, this is what I want. You have the confidence level, the skill level, you can get into ownership as, I mean, as quickly as you want to. And, and the management side is there to support you and help you get there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, this is actually a good one for being in Arizona. Do we offer partnerships? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We do offer partnerships. Uh, I'm currently in conversation with one of my docs uh, that's been with me five years now, and we're talking about partnership. I think it's a great thing uh, to have somebody who has been vested and developed that office and give them that opportunity. It's mutually beneficial. And the partnership, you're, based, you're, you're an owner as well. And I, I highly encourage it. I think in Arizona, I'm trying to count Dr. Uh, better not overstep, but I think there's two for sure partners in Arizona in addition to the owners. We have three owners and I want to say at least two partners, but there's conversations with, I think, two other people to become partners as well. So partnerships is definitely, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely out there. It's, I, I would say I, I would advocate for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to elaborate on that as well for, um, I guess, people who did not ask that question. So these are people who want to go into a partnership with Dr. Mather as the owner. So this isn't the partnership um, as I guess buying an office with, with ADMI. So these are people, the percentages of ownership are completely up to you guys, um, the owners of the practice. So Dr. Mather owns the office and he has a managing clinical director or MCD, which is basically a fancy way of saying lead doctor. 
um, that he's worked with that wants to buy into the practice with him as well. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so another question on ownership, somebody asked, how feasible is it to own a practice when you have student loans and you've just graduated? Um, if that's a good option, what are the challenges to manage the finances? So I guess if you have any advice on that. So what I would say, you know, I, I was like a lot of you guys, I got out of school with various types of debt. Uh, you know, I initially was going to just kind of pay my dues in terms of honing my skills. My initial first, in my mind, personal mind was two years, just sit there, grind, drill, fill, extract, do all the type of dentistry that I possibly can do just to get my skills to where I felt that I was clinically confident. Uh, from a you know, financial standpoint, you know, Aspen makes it very feasible to own an office and still maintain paying out all the, those other loans. It, it can be, it's quite, it was very fruitful. It was something that I didn't think was fathomable, but it's, they also have, I believe, Brenna, you might be able to help me on this one. Cause I know in Arizona, I know that I don't think they have this, but they, in certain parts of the country, I know they have some, uh, loan repayment mm -hmm. benefits and things of that nature mm -hmm. uh, that help to obviously mitigate some of those student loans. But man, those student loans, they come and they come fast and furious and it's, it's no fun. But I'm not gonna lie, becoming an owner at Aspinall, I have no student loan. <laughs> yeah, and um, somebody did ask that question actually. So that answers that. We do offer student loan opportunities. Um, to be completely honest, they probably are not going to be in Arizona. This is a pretty popular area. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's up to Dr. Mather, I guess. <laughs> but, right, yeah. But it's I mean, like, it's up to the, the owner of the practice that brings up the, the clinical autonomy again. But because all of our offices are individually owned by the doctors, student loan reimbursement is on a per office basis. It's up to the owner. Um, let's see, got some more ownership questions here. Um, somebody wants to know the relationship that you have with ADMI. So. Um, I, and it sounds like this is from a financial perspective. So what is the split, I guess, that you have of production, if you want to elaborate on that as an owner? Sure. So I, the way that the relationship works with ADMI in regards from the financial standpoint is, you know, we run the practice and we're going to develop top line revenue. And so whatever that top line revenue is, then you're going to have your overhead. And that overhead obviously then produces profit. So what ha ends up happening, happening, my fee as an owner of owning these practices and providing all and paying for all the resources that ADMI provides me, all that support and resources that they provide me is 45% of my profit uh, after all that's done. And so that is kind of, for a lack of a better word that a lot of people are more familiar mm -hmm. with franchises and things of that nature, it's somewhat of a royalty, but it is worth every dime and dollar. Um, I say it every... <laughs> every time every month when i'm talking to other dentists and i'm talking to other owners i'm just like how where do these new patients come from how do they provide this marketing how are where are these people coming that need this that or the other i just don't get it and i'm not going to question it every day i go in my schedule is full and i'm just like oh i'm very thankful for it but it's worth every dollar but that's kind of how the financial relationship works with aspen Dow. Mm -hmm. And I'll add on to that by saying that can also vary by state. I know certain states have certain laws and regulations, so it, it can vary a little bit depending on where you are, the owner, and where you're practicing. Um, and there's something that I wanted to add on to um, our last question about, like, I guess, finances and owning. And we actually did one of these sessions. I don't know if any of you guys logged into it. Uh, we did it, I think, two weeks ago with um, our vice president of practice ownership, and he got into the process of becoming an owner quite a bit. And I guess for the financial aspect, uh, buying an office within Aspen Dental is about half of what it costs to buy a, I guess, a private practice or acquire that from um, somebody else or another location. And again, you're getting that with all new equipment, state-of-the-art, everything within the office. So I want to say right now they're at around $350,000 for uh, brand That's new correct. offices. Mm -hmm. um, Switching topics here, we're going to get into office structure a little bit, um, but this is a question specifically for you. Someone wants to know how many dentists work for you, and since you are the owner, you're very involved in the hiring process, so what are the qualities that you look for when you are interviewing? 
Okay, so uh, two phase questions. So how many dentists uh, work for me? I have four full time dentists uh, that work for me, and then I have three part time dentists that work for me. And uh, with and kind of going into that, we're trying to purchase a couple more practices. So I have two other that are full time, but they're not officially mine, so to speak, under my uh, PC. Um, but to answer the question, what are the things that I'm looking for when I'm interviewing students or not students, but any, any type of doc, you know, I look for confidence. I look for somebody who can speak very, very well, um, is quick on their, you know, quick on their feet, but has a great personality. Uh, f you know, when we were talking to Mrs. Smith, you know, at the, when the, at the patient chair, you know, she's not going to, she's not going to know how your MOD filling was, you know, as long as it's not causing her pain at the end of the day, she cares about, Hey, the doctor Mather, he has good bedside manner. He remembered this, that, or the other about, Oh, I took a trip or I write little notes and tidbits, but like just being very personable, being amicable. Those are the things that I kind of look for when I'm doing interviews, mm -hmm. you know, also just kind of seeing how confident a person can express themselves, um, during that, during that, uh, interview process is important. Uh, one word of advice, this might be a little off topic, but one word of advice I have for all, specifically dental students is this. I wish somebody told me this when I was in dental school, especially if I was like a fourth year and you're kind of getting close to getting those credits completed. You know, a lot of like my mentality, like let me get my credits done so I can go hang out, do whatever I want. I wish somebody had told me like, hey, Mather, sit down, pick up a surgical handpiece, learn how to do surgical extractions and or whatever type of dentistry I wasn't clinically confident in. Um, for me, it was personally doing surgery. I was not very sound. Now I think I'm a lot more competent in it than I was when I got out. It was not something that I was trained in, but go do the type of stuff that while you're still under the umbrella of the dental school to hone your skills, use this time to get that, you know, to get that completed because man, it'll pay dividends for you as soon as you get out. If you're able to do things a lot quicker and, and, and just have that confidence, it, man, the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome that you brought that up because we actually just had a question submitted that said, what do you wish you had taken more advantage of in dental school to prepare for working at Aspen? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Elaborate. For sure. That, that answers it. But specifically, I guess to kind of get into it, I wish I did a little more, um, I did a lot of YouTube dentistry when I, you know, when I, once I got out of school and I don't know if that's still popular or not, but that's kind of how I got, I didn't do any tour eye removal. I literally watched some YouTube videos and I'm like, all right, let's, let's go, you know, and let's do this and started doing them, starting with easier cases and then started getting more confident with that. But I wish I started doing those things. Again, I never picked up, I truthfully never picked up a surgical handpiece in, in dental school. I, I'm somehow all my extractions were simple all 7140s, you know, like all day. But um, I wish I had like laid more flaps and just kind of developed myself in that regard. And, and just kind of spent a little more time with the removable aspect. And I'm saying that because a lot of our patients at Aspen Dental are blue collar non-compliant patients. They haven't been to the dentist for about four or five years. And so we're dealing with a lot of non-restorable or perio related patients so I end up doing a lot more removable, end up doing a lot more surgery, still do the bread and butter, still doing fixed pros and still doing operatives and things of that nature, work with implants, do veneer cases. Um, but yeah, I would say about 30% of my practices do removable practice, uh, removable prosthodontics. So, or prosthodontics. So I wish I just spent a little more time in dental school doing that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, and as I said, we'll move on to office structure a little bit um, before you brought that up. Um, sure. but we have a lot of questions about this, so just kind of switching topics here. Um, but I know you answered how many doctors work under you, but I guess within your office, how many doctors are typically in each practice? Oh, um, I would say in, truthfully, in the four practices that I own, I have one doctor in each, and we have one doc that floats amongst mm -hmm. the offices, and currently I'm floating as well. Mm -hmm. So I go to the other offices. So um, there's six that float. And then we have a couple part-timers that fill in for vacations and or uh, we flex flex days or something like that that come and fill in periodically. But four main docs in one office. We're trying to get to the level where we can support another doctor in those offices. That's definitely an initiative that we are, we are advocating for and we're looking into. Um, it was something we were going to do pre-pandemic, um, mm -hmm. but 
we're now pushing okay. we're trying to figure everything out, making sure that demand is there. But that's how I have four MCDs and all my offices, and then one associate, and then myself. I consider myself an associate, and I go and mentor and train. <laughs> an associate slash owner. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll say, like, I guess the the typical model would be each office having a lead doctor and uh, an associate. And the lead doctor could be the owner. A lot of times the owner kind of does what Dr. Mather does where they, they bounce around if they own multiple offices and, and go where the need is at. Or if they have a, a new hire, they'll do a lot of their training and mentorship there. Um, but yeah, the typical model is probably a two doctor model, or at least trying to get to that point where you have the, the patient flow to be able to support two doctors. Um, a couple follow-up questions to that. Um, how many dental assistants and how many hygienists are in your practices? Great, great question. So my uh, hygienist, I have two hygienists in each of my offices. One, we just started a second hygienist literally today, um, but we have two hygienists in all the offices and three of my offices have four assistants and one currently has three. Did I say assistant? Yeah, four four assistants and one has three. Okay. Three of four, one has three. That was confusing. <laughs> there we go. A tongue twister. Um, there you go. And did you did you say how many hygienists there were? I'm, two I'm, two hygienists in all my offices. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and then again on the topic of the offices. So on average, how many patients would you have? And since we have um, dental students on, about how many patients do you see in the office? And then how many patients? would, I guess, a new grad or an associate be seeing? Sure, okay, I'll, I'll kind of break that actually into three mm -hmm. questions. So seeing and having on the schedule are two very, very different things. <laughs> yes. So uh, I would, let's go with my busier office uh, or a standard Aspen Dental office. I would say we have roughly about 30 patients on the schedule, 30, I would say maybe 30 to 40, if I, 40, including hygiene, because um, mm -hmm. again, we have two hygienists on the schedule or at the office. Of those I'm seeing, I have my, the structure of my office is that we have three columns. I have a new patient column. I have, a, I have my production column, and then I have an overflow column. In the production column, I'm pretty much seeing everybody. Those are my patients. And that, you know, ranges from all the things that we're kind of talking about, fillings, crowns, extractions, immediate surgeries, um, implants, things of that nature. And then in my new patients, those are my new patient exams. And overflow is kind of where it gets flexible. And in overflow, what happens is I might have immediate denture adjustments, which my assistants can see. I may have uh, immediate alginate impressions, which my assistants can see. Um, I might be doing some quick denture steps or denture adjustments and things of that nature, which I'm kind of bouncing back or exams. Um, so that's kind of how the structure of my personal schedule works. And, what, and of course, now I forget the other part of the question. What was um, the other part? I guess uh, pertaining to an associate, like how many- Oh, the associate. Oh, initially when I had an associate, they, I basically, so maybe this is a better way to answer it. If I, I just hired actually an individual from Midwestern. He's been with me since, well, uh, right around pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> and what kind of, we have a set training plan. So what it would end up happening is I would have him come shadow one of my, he trained with an MCD, but I did what happened. He would train with me. He would shadow me for two weeks and then I would become his assistant. Like he starts doing things very slowly where he, I just want to see procedures and how he interacts with new patients. And I'm literally charting. I'm literally suctioning um, with, with that doc. Cause I want them to get hand on hand training and I want to be able to provide feedback, right? then and there right after the patient is gone. And I feel like it's very effective. Uh, but let's say they kind of get beyond that training point, we're kind of developing a schedule for them. Like when I was an associate, I had a single column and just an overflow column. So I would just be doing production at a time that was, that I felt confident that I could do. And overflow where again, co confident times that I felt that I could do. Initially, I'm gonna be honest, those times were a little bit spread out um, mm -hmm. just because that's how it is. You know, you kind of get out, you're a little bit, you want to make sure you have enough time. You don't want to be running late or anything like that. But gradually you would start seeing an, oh, what I would say a decrease in those timings just because you, you get clinically fast, you get clinically confident and the associates timing start to move up. But primarily they're working on a single column of production and helping out with some of the overflow and or maybe a new patient if the main doctor is bogged down. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the mentorship and that's something I wanna to get to right after this on office structure. We had one person ask, how big are your offices um, and how many operatories do you have? Oh, good question. So my, what, my busiest office is sound, sounds kind of counterintuitive. It's my <laughs> smallest office. It has six operatories. I wanna say it's like 2,400 square feet. My biggest office is probably 30, 500 square feet and it's got seven operatories um, and the other two also have seven operatories and they're probably around the 3200 square feet mark uh, but if you guys ever decide to join Aspen you become an owner vote, go for as many operatories as you can that's my advice for sure <laughs> um, and then I guess another one on office structure um, and what's going on in our practices um, sure. how many, or I guess, what are the most common procedures that you are seeing in your practice? Ooh, um, so I, I can kind of break it down like the business. So earlier I stated, you know, I do about 30% removable. Um, so what I mean by that is still doing like uh, immediate cases, immediate surgeries with immediate placements of dentures. I would say it takes about 30% of my business. I would say maybe a, another 30% is... Uh, fixed pros and operatives. And I would say the about 20% is hygiene and 10% is specialty, uh, where the specialty where we have a oral surgeon and an endodontist who come in, I haven't done a root canal in probably like seven years. And I hope I never have to do another one again, but we have an endodontist who comes in and takes care of all the, all the RCTs for me. And then for those medically compromised and or those uh, tougher surgical cases, uh, close to the sinus, uh, bisphosphonate related, or just impacted, severely impacted third molars where it's just not worth uh, my time or it's not beneficial for the patient for my hands to be on there, I get those over to the oral surgeon. Mm -hmm. and, and you answered another question about if we have specialty. So we do have endo and, and OS come into the practices. I would say they're usually in once or twice a month. Is that what you would agree? That's correct. My, my oral surgeon comes in once a month uh, and rotates amongst all the offices, including all the offices that I don't own, all the uh, Aspen Dental offices in, in the region. And my endodontist, he is coming in twice a month, but he is for some reason getting busy. So we're talking <laughs> maybe a little bit more in some of the offices, other offices, but uh, I said twice a month. Yeah, twice a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what's cool about specialty too is, I mean, if, if you are the doctor and you love doing endo, you can do all the endo that you Absolutely. Do if you don't have to, I guess, send it off to the specialists. Um, obviously, from a business perspective, it's more profitable to have the specialist do it. But if you love doing endo, you have the autonomy to be able to do all the endo that you want to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I'm, I had a doc who just loves doing endo and he lo and loves his Molando, so we put it on a schedule and it's timely. It makes business sense to do. So he enjoys it and he can get patients uh, right then and there uh, taken care of. So it's, it's good. But a majority of my docs, they, I don't know, it's, it's not popular for whatever reason it is. So, <laughs> um, Another question here about the office. Do you determine which insurance companies that you participate with? You know, um, that's a great question. I, you know, I kind of got a book and I just signed off on every insurance. Um, Aspen definitely kind of guided me in that regard. It's something that I'm, you have autonomy in. Uh, I just didn't know. Truthfully, I just didn't know a lot when I was getting involved with that. Now I know a lot more. So maybe it makes sense to do certain things or the other, but uh, Aspen definitely guided me in that regard. And I, I don't have any regrets on it. So they just kind of provide the insurances that we take and I just go with it. They give me all these patients. Why am I going to stop now? Mm -hmm. And I would say as a majority, we do accept pretty much all insurances. I think the, the commonality is the only two, we usually don't do uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Correct. I think that, that's pretty standard within the, the Aspen dental practices. But other than that, we should accept pretty much all insurances. Correct. Um, so I know I said we were going to talk about mentorship earlier, and we had a, a bunch of live questions come in about uh, office structure, which is, I guess, a great problem to have. Um, sure. So now moving on to mentorship, uh, we sure. do have a student based on here. So do you want to talk about the mentorship and onboarding that we have set up for new grads? Absolutely. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I would say, you know, the general uh, bringing on a new doc who's freshly graduated, you know, we would definitely want to spend time 
like I said, hand in hand with a doc who's seasoned. Uh, majority of the time, it's usually the owner doctor, or it could be one of the partners and or an MCD who's been with me an extended period of time. And so what happens is usually that doc is shadowing the MCD for the first two weeks. The, it could be the first week, first two weeks, kind of depends what, you know, when people want to dive in. But usually the first two weeks, they're kind of getting used to the model. They're understanding the computer systems, just the patient flow, verbiage, um, and just really monitoring the behaviors that the doctor is exuding. And then what we do is we start kind of role reversal where uh, I would start shadowing that doctor for certain procedures that certain new patient examine, kind of working them into the practice. And we do that for another couple of weeks. And then ideally in the last two weeks, that uh, doctor is now kind of running the practice with the guidance of the main doctor. Now, I will say, you know, usually it's a six to eight week plan, but we've definitely deviated from that. I would say a lot of the mentorship is kind of catered for the individual. Some people go through it a little bit quicker. Some people need a little bit more time in certain aspects of things. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is kind of self-driven, self-motivated, so to speak, but we would never allow anyone to drown. We were going to want people to set them up for success. It's definitely mutually beneficial, but I think it's on it's i've never seen anything like it even docs who um now that, now that are currently with me you know i have four of them that have trained with me they're always like man, man i just never knew i'd get that one-on-one -on -one interaction and let's say i'm at one of my other offices and a doc is having a problem they could call me on the phone i've had it where i've started at one office they're having a problem at something i'm like hold tight you know we'll work something out and i'm driving to that next office to help you know get a tooth out or whatever whatever the situation is we i'm we're really, really good about making sure that, you know, you feel supported and it's very hands-on support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's a very, very guided process, especially for new grads. I mean, we know new grad anxiety is real, right? You're coming out of school, you're used to seeing maybe like two patients a day, um, having to, you know, check off boxes for professors and, and things like that. And moving into a practice where you're seeing a lot more patients, I think um, you're worried about time getting like um, which I think is great to bring up to um, you will be allotted as much time as you need like right out the gate like you're Absolutely. in charge of the schedules right say it again what the schedule um, is the, yeah. you guys are in charge of your own schedules yeah well. absolutely we we have a actually they have a guide sheet where they tell us hey I, I asked the question hey how long do you think we need for doing a crown prep and the majority of uh, the students say two hours you know and like undisturbed two hours so <laughs> we're going to give them an undisturbed two hours of time and you know we kind of work our ways you know through the system and we can and it can be calibrated sometimes it moves from two hours to two and a half sometimes it moves from two to one uh, to 90 minutes um but it's definitely individually based but they have full autonomy on their on their times mm -hmm. yeah and, and like you said it's a guided process they it's very individualized you're not just thrown to the sharks and, and they teach you how to swim that way um, we do offer a lot of programs um, you go to our practice support center, um, you take a course called EDGE, which just kind of re-energizes you. You learn about the metrics of the offices um, and kind of all the beh behind the scenes work that goes in. Um, like you said, you're assigned a mentor, doctor, everything like that. So you have all the support you need to, to get you where you need to go. And um, also on the topic of, of learning, somebody asked if we offer CE courses, if you want to add on. Yeah, no, we absolutely. There's so we definitely do offer CE classes uh, or courses uh, online. There's a plethora of, uh, I, I've never even gone through all the online. It's amazing to me how all these online courses get placed on. We have online webinars and we also have in um, pre-COVID, we had in course or in-person courses as well uh, related to crowns or removable. Um, I also took uh, pre-COVID, I was trying to get all my docs trained with implants and we were going to do a didactic class. So we all flew them all to Chicago, went to Chicago and uh, took an uh, implant course, the didactic of restoring implants there. And we were going to do something with a surgical placement, but COVID hit, unfortunately. But we're very involved with doctor development. Um, you know, I have docs that want to, we did uh, iTero uh, or Invisalign training last or maybe a year and a half ago. And all the docs, we went out to a resort and learned about iTero and Invisalign, but 
we're all about learning and developing our dogs. We're about staying with technology as well. And so it's something that Aspen, you know, we really, really strive on. We kind of, this might sound really cheesy, but like when I think of a solid, really solid brand or a, a company, I kind of think of Apple. Uh, sorry for all those Samsung people, but <laughs> I really think Aspen's trying to be like the Apple of dentistry, so to speak. You know, we want to have a really good solid image, good customer service. Um, or whatever company that is to you. Um, we just want to be that company that people think when they think dentistry, they think Aspen. Um, and in order for us to be successful, we have to be well-trained. We have to be clinically knowledgeable. We have to be up to date. Um, and so that's something that Aspen readily provides for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you just keep bringing up like so many good topics that I feel like an hour just isn't enough time. <laughs> oh, no problem. No worries. I'm going to have to pour myself a cocktail, but we're good. <laughs> um, but I'm glad you brought up the Itero scanners and um, Invisalign, all of our offices have gotten iTero scanners throughout the last year. And, and like you said, we're training in the process, I think kind of nearing the end of launching that, but um, trained all of our doctors to be able to do Invisalign, which I thought was pretty cool and, and became, I think, the largest purchaser and partner for Invisalign uh, with That's the iTero scanners. Um, and on CE, again, uh, for those of you who logged on a little bit late, I did have a link up at the beginning. We are offering free CE um, to everybody right now. So I'll email that link out um, after this if you guys are interested in, in knocking out some of that CE. Um, like Dr. Mather said, his advice would be to get on that stuff while you're Absolutely. in Absolutely. Um, but moving on to some questions in our live Q&A here, we actually had some more about ownership pop up. So I'm, I want to sure. make sure we get to those. Um, so this one is, how do you determine that a practice is worth owning? Um, once you determine that you want to buy one, do you reach out to Aspen Dental and do they deal with it or how does that work? That's a great question, actually. Uh, it has to make empirical evidence sense. So that might sound really cheesy, but the numbers have to make sense and it's going to make sense from both sides. And so with ownership, you know, you get the office producing and churning at a certain level. Um, and that's all related also to cost. So there's not like a set number, so to speak, like, okay, you get to this number and now this is an office ready to, to own. It's very different from office to office, region to region. But believe me, if you're solid and you're a solid doc and you're a hard worker, I mean, you could reach out to, I mean, I would, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but the, Aspen will definitely reach out to you and they, if they find a good partner, they're going to be like, Hey, I want to grow with this individual and help them grow. Cause it, it's again, mutually beneficial, uh, but there is no like set number, but you, if you're definitely wanting to own and you're producing well, and you'll know you're producing well, cause your earnings are going to be like, Oh man, this is good. And then it can only be better. And that's literally what happens. And you can reach out to Aspen, but I'm pretty sure your operative team, um, your operations team is going to be like, oh, this is somebody we want to grow with in the future. And they'll be right on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that you brought up, use the term mutually beneficial, because I think that's really important to bring up because it is a partnership. So um, like you're both basically like buying in. I think we call it like a marriage. It's kind of the- It is thing, like a marriage. The thing that we bring up around here. So um, like, we don't want to sell you an office if it's not going to be profitable, that's not going to benefit you. So, right. it, so it's a partnership and it's definitely Absolutely is. together. Um, so that goes into the process of buying an office. And we have an entire ownership team that's dedicated to getting you guys to that spot. Um, so those are the people that I guess you would reach out to and work with in the process of becoming an owner. Right. And I see that Dr. Cooper hopped on, uh, just nice. in time for the last like 10 minutes of this. Um, I want to see, um, Dr. Cooper, if you want to, I don't know if you're having issues with your volume, but if you want to say hi, you're more than welcome to, um, and if not, I will, while he figures that out, answer another question here. Um, does Aspen Dental help you buy practices in other states, I, like Texas? I guess that's specific. Um, so it sounds like they want to know um, if you can buy practices other than Arizona. Or if you, if you own multi-state offices, yeah. I will, um, I can speak on my experience. I personally don't know if I could do multi-state offices, but I do know owners who do multi-state offices, but they're more on the East Coast where the uh, the states are a little bit closer. So somebody could be owning, and I don't want to uh, show my stupidity of like 
Pennsylvania is if it's close to Ohio or whichever states are close to each other, there might be uh, you know owners that own uh, multiple offices. I know there's an owner named Jeff Christie. He owns 23 offices, and I know he's all up in the Northeast, and they're in various states. And he just he has a little motor, um, like a RV type thing, and he just drives it around to all these offices and does his thing. So I'm not saying it's not possible. It's just I think it makes more sense to be clinically present um, or clinically accessible. Uh, would be kind of my advice, but I've, it, but it has been done, but it's, I've never seen it on the West Coast. I've only heard of it in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely doable if that's if that's what you're interested in doing. And I think we say we're a say yes organization. So if it's what you really want to do, I think that there's a way to make it happen. And we do have owners, like you said, out East, which I think proximity of the states is the reason it's a lot easier to do out there, um, like you said. Um, but as far as owning different states, I think the, the probably the big line to process probably licensing and things like that and making sure you're able to practice in different states but it's definitely doable if that's what you are interested in doing um, another question here is what types of implants do you use in your office how time consuming and productive is it um, and I want to add on to that by um, can you talk about the supplies in the office and the autonomy over equipment that you use sure so in regards to the implant question, we are we have a partnership with Novo BioCare, and that's pretty much the system that we work with. Um, but if a patient comes in with another system, we can order the parts or talk to the rep there and they bring the tools in and we can work on those implant parts as well. But primarily all Novo BioCare. In regards to being productive, it's very productive. Um, I personally don't place implants yet. I used to place minis, um, but I... COVID hit, we, we were on track to go learning how to place surgical uh, or they're just learning how to place implants on our own as a, as a GD. But, um, but as of right now, the way it works is our oral surgeon places all our implants for us. It's productive because he does it. He does it really quick. He has them in and out in, and out in less than 10 minutes um, for a lot of these placements. And then in regards to, you know, we follow the proper protocol in terms of healing and things of that nature, depending on what you're doing. And then we do the restorations and it's, it's definitely something I would advocate learning how to do if that's something you need a little more um, experience with, but I definitely think it's beneficial to do so. Uh, to answer the questions in regard to supplies, you order whatever you want. They don't, I've got to order whatever I've wanted. It's never been an issue whatsoever. My docs, they're like, I want this cement. I want this tool. I want this, that, or the other. It's like, let's get it ordered. It's never been a problem. Um, and so, yeah, you have total clinic. Total clinical autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and you brought up, so yes, we do have that partnership with Novell, um, which is obviously what most of our doctors use. It's one of the big perks of being within an organization is you can get um, supplies at a cheaper cost. So that is what the majority of our doctors use. But I do think it's important to add on that if there's something really specific, I guess you want to use, or um, you should have a preference, you do have the ability to be able to, I guess, use whatever tools and supplies you'd like within your practice. I think without getting too businessy, it basically just comes out of, you know, your, your P&L, if your office, which is a profit loss statement. Um, so I guess if your office can afford it, then you have the opportunity to use it. I guess that's kind of the, uh, the best Correct. way to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I see Dr. Cooper joined us. I don't know if he's having issues here. Um, is your volume working? It is, yeah. Awesome. Do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? <laughs> hi, I'm Dr. Cooper. Um, I graduated from Midwestern last year, so I graduated in May. Um, what time is it to y'all? Is it six? It is seven o'clock here. Oh, okay. I guess I thought I was two hours ahead of y'all. That's why I jumped on when I did. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. False. No worries. Yeah. So, um, I'm glad that you could join us. Um, while you're on, we're actually kind of nearing the end of our time here, um, but there was one thing I really wanted you to bring up, which is because you are um, a recent graduate, if you want to talk about the mentorship and onboarding process that you have gone through with sure. that so far. Sure. So onboarding is actually really nice. Um, they find an office for you and they put you there for a minimum of four weeks. Um, you're paired up with a doc and they have a pretty regimented schedule for you. Um, the first week you do a lot of pretty much shadowing and getting to know the doc for the first couple of days. And then they start letting you do procedures, um, kind of just to see where your skill level is. 
And then depending on kind of where you're at skill level wise, for me, by the end of the second week, I was just running my own column. Um, I was in, am in kind of a little unique situation. My mentor doc and the office I'm going to, he's still there. So I've been with my mentor doc since July because that's when I started. Um, and then we're obviously working together. So, um, but most of the time you're not in the office, you'll be working in. So it's kind of nice because you get the feel for a different doc, a different office, kind of how they do things. And then when you go to your office, you get another doc or another experience. So um, it's really quite helpful. Um, and you kind of take the pace you want. Um, if you're nervous to do something, you got a doc there to tell you how they do it and kind of give you some help and guidance. But if you're just killing it, then they just let you do your thing. <laughs> well, that's good. Sounds like you've had a pretty good onboarding experience. And I will say, because it is seven o'clock, um, if people want to hop off, I won't hold it against you, but we do have a lot of questions still in here. So if you guys don't mind, I'll just go ahead and read through those. Um, but like I said, if people want to hop off, I did offer people a gift card for logging in. So you'll still get your gift card if you hop off because this is nearing the end. Um, but just to, um, if you guys aren't, I guess, are able to um, stay on, then I'm going to go ahead and read through a few more of these questions. Perfect. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Let's see where to start. Um, what are the Aspen guidelines and restrictions you have to follow in your offices? Um, and I guess how much control do you have over how to run the office? Um, Dr. Mather, do you want to take this one? Sure. So in regards to how the office runs, I mean, you partner with the operations team, you partner with your office manager, basically, and you kind of conform the schedule to how you want it, but it pretty much runs how the doctor wants it to run, so to speak. Well, you know, the operations definitely provides guidance in regards to, you know, what, how to optimize um, patients in, in the schedule and things of that nature, but you have full autonomy on how your schedule goes. Uh, it's never usual. It's not, it's not an issue whatsoever. You don't have to uh, be like, oh, I need to, see. again, like there's no quotas. You don't have to see the 40 patients or anything like that. Today I had a slower day. I saw like, like 15, 20 patients, including hygiene. It was a bit slower. So it's nothing like that. It's your office manager usually gets the schedule going. You form a partnership with them. They understand your timings and things of that nature. And um, they just start creating a schedule that makes sense. So if you see a hiccup in your schedule, it's always in morning huddle or, or the days in advance. You do schedule audits, you check to make sure everything looks like it'll go smooth and just kind of go from there. But eventually you just get so clinically confident. You just go in there and you're just like, oh, let's get through the day. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Cooper, I guess you can provide a, a good perspective as, as an associate. So I guess what kind of autonomy in your office do you have at the associate level right now? Um, I mean, honestly, the same. Um, Dr. Lloyd and I, he's the MCD in my office. Um, we pretty much just look at the schedule. And like I said before, he was my mentor doc. So he already knows my skill level. He knows what I can do. And for the most part, he knows I can run my own schedule. So the only thing, like sometimes he'll ask me questions if he thinks I want to try something. Um, if he does, then he'll cancel that hour for his day so that he can be there with me if it's something I've never done. Um, like third molar extractions, we, I didn't get a whole lot of that in Midwestern. So, but that's something we do. We do a lot of extractions. So um, that's just something that I'm doing now. And the first few patients, he just did it with me. So as far as kind of what I can do on my schedule, pretty much the same, whatever I feel comfortable with, um, I just do it. Awesome. <laughs> well, that sounds great. Um, so another question here, this one sounds like it might be someone who logged on a little bit late because they asked um, what ADMI was. So we talked about that in the beginning of it. Um, it's basically Aspen Dental Management Inc., which is the company that partners with our Aspen Dental practices. Um, so they also said, what do you mean by purchasing an office as a DSO? Um, and how much would that be? So I don't know if you want to, is, do you have an answer for that, Dr. Mather, as an owner? Um, sure. By purchasing an office as a DSO? Yeah, so you know, you kind of agree on a purchase price. Uh, like uh, Brenna said a little bit earlier, you know, m right now, most Aspen practices are going for around 350,000. Uh, and what a DSO is, is you're, uh, you're basically purchasing support and you are purchasing somebody who can make sure you have new patients coming through your door marketing, advertising, all your bookkeeping is taken care of, your hiring, um, your inter, you know, interviews. If you want to be involved with your interviews, I highly recommend it, but be involved with your interviews um, and just 
the hands-on. You have total autonomy on your hands-on, but they do everything under the sun and you basically have to just take care of the patient, do the dentistry. And that's literally how it's split. And it's, it's a, it's a great marriage. Mm -hmm. And I, to add on to that, so you guys, as the doctors, if you're the owner, you do own 100% of the practice. 100%. Yeah. So I think what they mean by like, I guess being a little bit confused as as purchasing an office within a DSO is when you do buy the practice, you are like buying into, I guess, a partnership, you can call it with, with Aspen Dental. So you are in a business agreement as far as, you know, um, production and in that split and what ADMI does for you and, and everything like that. So you own the office, but you are in a business agreement with the management side. Correct. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good way to say that. Um, let's see here. Um, Dr. Cooper, I think this might be a good question for you is how competent are Midwestern students when they freshly graduate compared to other schools? And what are the growing pains of starting out? So I guess what have you noticed in your experience so far? Sure. Um, Obviously, skill level is all dependent on who you are as a student anyway. But in my experience with um, production wise at school, I was probably middle of a class. Um, I for sure wasn't producing at the top, but I wasn't at the bottom. Um, and a, a lot of that has to do with your patients, right? Kind of who you have and who you're assigned and if they show up to, do, to get work done. But, um, my first couple of weeks, kind of the biggest hurdle and struggle is getting used to seeing more than two or three patients a day. Um, sounds like we've kind of already talked about it. You're seeing Slow days, 15 patients, busy days, you're seeing 20, 25, depending on your office, right? And so biggest hurdle was kind of learning when good stopping points were, when you can jump in and out of, you know, you're off to go see other patients. As far as clinically, though, um, really, there wasn't a whole lot that I didn't feel confident doing um, besides some of the extractions that we just, I didn't get experience with, like I said, third molars. Um, But I mean pretty much everything I'm, I felt good about. Mm -hmm. I'll add on to that by saying I have personally heard great things about Midwestern grads. That makes anyone feel any better. Um, I just hired a Midwestern grad. Yeah. We won't say any names, but I hope he's doing well. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, And here's another good question is how long is the partnership contract with Aspen once you decide to go with them? Um, And I will have um, Dr. Mather, if you want to take this, Um, And I'll start off just by saying too, like, I feel like we don't, we don't really use the term contract within our company to start us off. But if you want to talk about it. Sure. Um, With this partnership, uh, from my standpoint, it's hopefully going to be lifelong. Um, It'll be, I retire with the company and then kind of figure that, you know, figure out what happens at that point. But I have, there's no set a lot of time that, Hey, I'm going to be an owner, owner for X amount of years. Uh, To me, this is, I'm in for the long haul. This is going to be, this is my practice. You know, the Aspen provides, again, support and partnership in relation to the management side of things. Um, But to me, it's until I retire. And then that's, Mm -hmm. that's about it. Yeah. And I think as far as um, not being an owner, like just going into Aspen and signing, um, I think, I guess people want to know is a lot of times when there's a contract, like uh, you have to work too much. Yeah, there's no, um, I, at least with the docs that I hired, there's no, like, if you sign on with me, you have to be with me for a year or anything like that. Uh, there's no um, c- contractual amount of time that you're obligated to stay um, in a certain amount of time or anything like that. The, uh, yeah, there's nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Dr. Cooper, anything? I saw you kind of shaking your head. <laughs> the only The only thing that is a little different with that is if you do get a sign on bonus or if you do move and they give you a moving stipend, those are time frame. So, and it depends on how long you work with the company. Typically it's a, a year and then you don't have to pay it back. But I know for my sign on bonus and for my moving stipend, um, if I leave the company before a year is up, then I have to pay that money back. So that's the only thing that's like a time frame. Other than that, you can leave whenever you want. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, obviously, if you have student loan reimbursement or anything like that, it kind of goes within that model as well. But I mean, there's, yeah, no, no time restrictions, no radius clause, um, nothing like that. And I think that is, um, that's a question I get a lot when I do lunch and learns as well. And I um, completely understand why people ask. I mean, I think sometimes there's skepticism 
around around DSOs. So we like to allow the opportunity for people to, you know, go see if it's for them. And hopefully it is. But if it's not, you there's nothing saying like you have to finish out your your two years. You know, we really have patients in mind. And if you're unhappy, you're probably not providing your best care to patients. I think that's kind of the, the mindset that we have with that. Um, that is that question. Um, all right, you know, here's one. Um, every place has pros and cons, obviously. So is there anything that you think could be a con or things that you think that Aspen Dental could do better? Um, do you wanna start with that, Dr. Mather? Um. Oh, con. That's a good question. I, I, I remember I read that question. The one thing I, I will say, and this is just getting into like, I guess my personal day to day are, you know, our, sometimes our hours are, can be a little bit demanding, at least my personal hours, uh, you know, we work nine hours, four days a week, but then we work five hours on Friday and Fridays I love, but I guess maybe that's the only thing just <laughs> sometimes it's like the days can kind of drag out. Um, in that regard, but not, I'm used to it now, but I, I'm just trying to make a con for it to be a con, but I don't find it really a con. Uh, well, that's a great answer. And what about you, Dr. Cooper, and your experience so far? Um, I mean, for sure, kind of the same timeline with as far as you're working a lot, working as a, any DSO, you're going to be seeing a lot more patients than you will in a private practice office. So you work, even if it's similar hours in office, you're seeing a lot of patients. So that gets tiring. And then kind of the only con, especially for those, you know, Midwestern grads is we learn a lot about being a general dentist and doing a lot of dentistry. And obviously it depends on where you go with Aspen as far as the location, but the population, the demographic of patients we see, um, it, you're not going to see a whole lot of cosmetic cases. You're not going to see a whole lot of full mouth restorative, at least where I am. And so if that's something that you really love, then that's something that down the road you either have to implement in your practice or kind of look somewhere else. So that's really the only con that I've seen so far though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like you said, that's definitely very location um, specific. So if there are certain aspects of dentistry that really fascinate you when you're going through the recruiting and the hiring process, that's stuff that you can talk about people with. Like um, you can, you know, like talk to Dr. Mather and, and see in his multiple offices, what he sees and in the patient demographics and um, try to find a place that best fits what you, what, what really, I guess you like to do and enjoy about dentistry. Um, and another, uh, I guess, add on to that question was um, how open is Aspen or in your experience, have they been to listening to you as an individual um, with like, I guess, if you have anything in your office, do you feel like Aspen listens to you if you have? Oh, hundred percent. You know, it's a hundred percent. They, um, anything, it, it, again, you're the hundred percent, the owner, they provide, they provide guidance. They put, it's a part, it's a partnership. Um, I don't get any real pushback. If it is, it's usually constructive. And I'm like, oh man, for facets of things that I may have never thought of um, just in regards to like the hours that we're talking about, you know, um, that was a good example was we kind of found, you know, I was kind of used to the, uh, we had an 8.30 to 5.30 Monday through Friday or an 8 to 5 on Friday. And by the research that they had done, they found that Friday afternoons were not that busy. But if we extended the hours on the other days, we can um, maybe capture more patients and get patients access to care. That initially, like when I heard of it, I was like, oh man, I'm working an extra a little bit of time, um, an extra hour a week or something like that. But in the long run, it pays dividends. Um, it's been very fruitful and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it was something initially, and there was no pushback. It was not like, hey, let's give it a try. If I didn't want it, I could go back. If I didn't even want to do it, I didn't even have to do it. Um, but I'm glad I did because they, they, they understand how the markets are working. Mm -hmm. And anything from you, Dr. Cooper, to add? <laughs> um, not really. I mean, the only thing... I guess you'd have to keep in mind, especially for most, since obviously this is for Midwestern students and other, you know, new grads, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to jump into being an owner right away. And so if there's a skill set that you have, if there's an instrument that you want that you don't see, um, you just have to talk to the owner doc. And I haven't had any issues getting what I need, though. Um, just ask for it. And if they can fit it in the budget, they're doing it. So um, have haven't had any pushback. Mm hmm. Um, another great question that I saw on here was um, asking about the relationship that you guys have with your patients. Um, I think this person is a little bit concerned about like, I guess with the DSO model that 
um, you're not gonna have the same relationship with your patients. So, um, and Dr. Mather, do you wanna start this off with, I guess, patient sure. retention and things like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I would say, you know, I, I had the same thinking when I graduated, uh, you know, you just have the DSOs have this type of stigma with them. And there was something that I thought of as well. But it's really what you make of it. Like I, I have again have total autonomy. I have patients that bake me cookies, knit, knit <laughs> me socks, um, bring all types of stuff, get a lot of family referrals because it's the clinician that you are. You have time to spend with the patient. It's not something like where I have to bang out all these patients. I know the numbers that I may have said initially with the pure number of patients that I see is, um, you know, it's a it's a larger number that that dental school students are accustomed to, but it's very manageable. It's something that I'm not rushed or hurried. It's very systematic. It's, it's pragmatic. It's figured out, but I'm able to be very patient and, you know, it's very patient centric. I, I have a lot of recall in all my businesses. That's why I have two hygienists um, in my offices that are able to support that. So, you know, recall is something important. They've found a, they found a home um, at Aspen Dental and something that I, pride myself to make sure that patient that our reputation is there and patients enjoy coming to see that particular office, those particular doctors, because reputation is very important to me. So, and I go to sleep very well at night and everything is very ethical. There's no, you know, hanky panky. That's a weird word, but yeah, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's what you make of it. It's the kind of, kind of person you are, but you can, um, yeah, your, your patients start to love you. They love you. It's, it's amazing what you do for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and anything from you, Dr. Cooper? Uh, I mean, yeah, just a small note on that. Um, so the office that I'll be going to isn't built yet. So I've been jumping around different offices just in the meantime, which is great because they could have furloughed me for, you know, a few months, but they've allowed me to work in other offices. Anyway, I'm in a small town right now that they, their doctor left. Anyway, um, just in the three weeks I've been here, I've had multiple patients want to go to Fort Worth where I'm going to be working just to get treated by me. And I've only been here for three weeks. And it's not that I'm amazing, um, but <laughs> like Dr. Mather was saying, is. you have, well, yeah, that's it. But you have time to sit down with each patient. You have a time to make a relationship with them. And yeah, it's not dental school. You're not sitting there for an hour having a chit chat about their grandkids soccer game that was last weekend, but you do get to know about them a little bit. And eventually you'll get to the point where you see them enough because you're doing their work that maybe you do talk about the grandkids soccer game. Mm -hmm. Um, and Dr. Cooper, this was like a, a question directed towards you um, about has Aspen, I guess, met or exceeded the expectations that you had going into, I guess, with COVID, that can kind of be a little bit, a little different, but I guess, it's, but as much as you can elaborate on that. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start off by just kind of the company taking care of me aspect. Um, obviously, with COVID, we weren't sure what was going on. And they've pretty much been over backwards to get me the training that I need, get me in an office, get me seeing patients, um, which is great because like a, they didn't have to do that. Um, a lot of companies have furloughed a lot of people in this time. Um, I mean, I'm staying in a hotel. They're giving me a per diem. They're paying a lot of money for me to be doing dentistry, plus they're paying me. So from that aspect, I feel well taken care of. Um, as far as the dentistry goes, lots of patients all the time. So um, I don't feel like I missed out on anything. Um, I mean, I jumped in in July to a full patient list and that was when some offices were closed down. So Aspen's doing a really good job keeping the patients come in and keeping us busy, which is great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I mean, what I guess you can elaborate on that as well, Dr. Mather, if you would like, as far as your expectations with joining Aspen. <laughs> oh, it is uh, it's, uh, to the moon. Like I, like I was saying earlier, I, they opened my eyes to things that I didn't even think was possible. Um, like I, I went in with the mentality that I'd, you know, be here, like, you know, this is the, you know, be a short relation, not a short relationship, but a couple year relationship and go out into private practices, follow the, the normal model. And like I said, they come in and they really invest in you. They really, really do. They spend the time, energy and resources to make sure that you can develop and be coached and be the best dentist that you can be, so to speak. And, if you are hardworking and you you uh, utilize the resources that you've been taught and the training that you've been given, it becomes very, very fruitful. And it's something, again, I feel is unparalleled uh, in, in dentistry. And again, open my eyes. Like I never thought I would be a multi, 
practice owner. It's not something that I even thought was in the cards. Mm -hmm. um, well, those are great answers from both of you. That makes me happy to hear. So thank you very much for that. Um, and there is, I guess, one more question. I know we're definitely over our time here and, and I know you guys both have things to do. Um, so if anyone has any last minute questions they wanna throw in the Q&A, um, please do that right now. But um, to end, I know you answered this a little bit, Dr. Mather, but Dr. Cooper, um, as a recent grad, what advice do you have for fourth years who are gonna be looking around for jobs and interviewing? What's the best advice that you could give to them? Um, I mean, that's a really good question because everyone's <laughs> unique and individual in what they want, right? So honestly, the kind of the big thing that Aspen is going to give you is an environment where you can keep learning dentistry and not feel overwhelmed and by yourself. Um, they don't throw you into an office and hope you can just survive. Um, they give you tons of resources. If you don't have a mentor doc in your office, you have phone numbers for everyone who's just pretty much on call waiting for you. Um, I had a patient who I had some implant questions for because we didn't have the parts and I texted someone and within five minutes I got a call. So as far as kind of what you're looking for, um, if you're looking for that mentorship, if you're looking for a stable office and you're looking to just see a bunch of patients and do a really good dentistry, then ask me an awesome place for you. Um, as far as kind of interviewing, just kind of be yourself. Um, <laughs> you want to have a good fit with the doc in the office that you're working with. And that's really important because that relationship with you and the other doc in the office you're with is going to really kind of make or break if you like working for any company in general, um, whether it's Aspen or whether it's another, you know, DSO or just a private office in general. So um, those are kind of things that I would look for is who you're going to be working with, what kind of team environment you're going to have. And then, you know, if you're just willing to see a lot of patients and do a lot of good dentistry, um, we do work hard, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um and Dr. Mather, any, any advice, any more advice, I guess, from you as far as students interviewing? In regards to students interviewing, uh, kind of just segueing from what Dr. Cooper said, yeah, be yourself, be confident, you know, I would say come prepared, you know, that's one thing um, that, you know, we kind of look at, it sounds weird, you know, I'm going to give you a little, I guess, a cheat to the test, but you know, come prepared, know what you're interviewing for, understand what company you're going for, kind of know, um, how it started. If you kind of know those things, it shows that you're really involved or invested. Um, and so that kind of perks our ears quite a bit. We're like, oh, wow, this, this candidate's really into Aspen Dental or whatever, wherever they're kind of going. But um, be yourself, show it, you know, you got to be yourself. It, it, I tell I tell people this all the time. Aspen may not, is not for everyone. You know, it's, it's a mutual relationship. But I will say this, I feel blessed to work at Aspen Dental. The docs that work at Aspen Dental, they, for the most part, really are like, oh, man, I feel lucky to be with this company. Um, so it's, you know, from my standpoint, I always feel like, hey, the people that we're letting in, we we really see a lot of value. And it's something that we, you know, we I interview and then I, I also do uh, request a shadow day. Um, that's something else that I would highly, highly recommend. I think it's mutually beneficial. I've had it where docs get super excited, like, oh, my gosh, you're doing this, that or the other. And I've truthfully had it where I've, I like the doc and sh they shadow. And they're like, wow, you're doing you do a lot of, you do a lot of dentures or in that day, I might've been doing a lot of dentures and that's not a facet of dentistry that interests them. You know, they were looking for something else. So it's better to know at that time. So that's something else that I would highly recommend. If, if any of you guys ever want to come shadow any of my offices, we could set something up. Brenna, you could get in touch with uh, Balt and get that take care of. They just want to come shadow for a few hours and see how the offices are run. And that way they get a, you know, one, uh, the real look, because there's no, you know, you're not going to pull, pull, pull the wool over your eyes. I want you to see how everything is. Yes, I, definitely. Yeah, I know. I don't know if Dr. Mathers remembers this, but I actually shouted in his office. You did. <laughs> I do. I was like, I know this face. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got on. I'm glad yep. you're, you're with Aspen. Um, so I was given an offer, but being in Dallas and being in, I was obviously in Phoenix. Um, they probably would have flown me out if I asked, but there was an office down the street. So I went and spent a day with Dr. Mather and it was great. Um, obviously he did a lot of good dentistry, but he took time to just answer my questions. Him and I just chatted in the break room. Um, I didn't feel overwhelmed. I didn't feel like I was taking him away from his day, um, but I highly recommend it. Go to an Aspen, go to one of his practices, like he said, and it'll really give you a feel for what we do. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, and I would say like, I feel like the best thing you can do is ask a lot of questions. Um, Cause obviously you, Aspen's not the only option of what you can do after dentistry or after dental school. Um, there's, you know, private practice, other DSOs, public health residency. There are so many different options for you guys to explore. And the only way you're going to find out what's best for you is by asking those questions. And I mean, on, like joining webinars like these and, and learning and um, make sure you really understand the, the answers to those questions. Right. So I think, you know, like, like Dr. Mather said, Aspen's not for everybody. Um, I mean, we hope that you guys join on and love it, but the fact of the matter is it's not for everybody. So explore your options, get out there. Like they said, shadow an office. Um, I'll be sending out um, a follow-up email after this. So you guys will have my information. I'm sure if you have any questions, these two doctors would be happy to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I can set up any of those shadow dates. Like Dr. Mather said, I would be happy to do so. Um, but yes, you guys will be hearing from me. So I will put you in contact with these guys. And if you want to talk to me about the recruiting process and anything like that and job opportunities, I'd be happy to talk with you guys about any of that stuff. Um, but if you don't have any more follow-up questions, then I think that we can go ahead and call this a night. Uh, it's about 7.30, so we did go over time, but that's great. We had a lot of great questions. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks to both of our doctors. Um, I really appreciate you guys joining. I know Dr. Cooper, you joined us a little late, but you know, we went over time, so it's fine. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so um, again, I really appreciate it. I will get in touch with everybody, um, but thank you, and I hope you guys all enjoy your night. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good thank night. Thank you. Bye.